Ivan Makanin was born in St. Petersburg in 1888. A very intelligent and creative man, after his technical education was completed, he founded his own engineering firm. During the war, he was involved in various military projects, the specific nature of which are apparently lost to history. Following the October Revolution, he somehow navigated the transition to communism without being purged and designed three successful diesel locomotives that operated on the Nikolaev line that links St. Petersburg to Moscow. An experimental electric engine of his also ran on the line but never saw operational service. In 1920, he switched his focus to aviation. An initial study of a vast airship capable of carrying 960 tons of cargo was promising on paper, but beyond the sophistication of the Soviet industrial base. It was perhaps for this reason that he chose to relocate to Paris to pursue his dreams of flight, arriving sometime in 1921. Makanin seemingly succeeded in leaving on relatively good terms. Scientific papers of his continued to be published in Russia throughout the 1920s. Once again, he was able to establish what we'd now probably call a research centre, where he studied, amongst other things, multi-stage rockets and alternative aircraft designs. A rare success in this period was a process to create aviation fuel from coal. His company of carburants Makanin sold its products for road vehicles and riverboats, but the plant was closed down in 1927 for unspecified environmental reasons. The existence of its share certificates is a rare piece of evidence that any of what I'm describing happened at all. Makanin then went back to aviation, ultimately producing his masterwork. In this instance, the problem he was trying to solve was that of giving an aircraft an aerofoil with sufficient area to provide the lift needed for a short takeoff, but also the low drag required to take advantage of increasingly powerful aero engines. In a way, his solution was brilliantly simple. Fit an aircraft with a telescoping wing that could extend in flight to provide greater area. During takeoff and landing, the pilot could use the maximum wingspan, increasing the lift. By reducing the size of the wing once airborne, it was possible to reduce drag and increase flight speed. Development of the Mach 10 was completed in 1929. Constant strike action by French aircraft workers and the not insignificant impact of the Great Crash delayed the start of prototype construction until 1931. It was eventually funded by the Armée de l'Air. The Mach 10 was a dashing kind of plane, a large two-seat all-metal monoplane with fixed undercarriage. It was powered by a 12-cylinder W-configuration water-cooled Lorraine engine that gave a rather paltry 480 horsepower. This drove a two-bladed propeller and occupied the forward section of the fuselage. Things now take a turn for the odd. In order to fit the wing telescoping mechanism, the cockpit was pushed far back in the fuselage. It wasn't an enclosed design for the pilot, who had just a windscreen. The observer, however, was buried in the rear fuselage near the tail and had to squeeze in through a hatch on the upper surface. The hatch could be fared in if required for aerodynamic reasons. In between the engine and the pilots was the relatively simple but quite bulky wing structure. Ailerons were attached to the fixed section of the wing and are therefore smaller and more inboard than was typical of contemporary aircraft. A half horsepower pneumatic pump powered from the engine enabled the wings to be moved in and out in flight. There was also a backup manual system. Only two positions were permitted. When the control was pushed in the cockpit, the outer sections rolled out on bearings running along fixed spars. When retracted, the span was 42 feet 8 inches with 204.5 square feet of area. Fully extended, they gave a span fully 68 feet and 11 inches across and 355 square feet of area. To give you a sense of proportion, the 1935 Hawker Hurricane had a 40 foot span and 259 square feet of area. Fully extended, the Makanin had greater wing area than the much later Grumman Hellcat. The Mach 10 was, however, a heavy aircraft. It weighed 11,000 pounds at maximum takeoff weight, and that's without the weapons, radios, and other kit a combat aircraft would have required. That's nearly twice as much as a Hurricane. The prototype flew for the first time on August the 31st, 1931. The wing mechanism performed perfectly, but high weight and low power restricted performance. Flat out, it was capable of only 186 miles an hour, 
40 slower than the biplane Hawker Fury that represented 1931's performance benchmark. Fortunately, more powerful engines were quickly becoming available. By 1935, McAneen and the Air Force decided to have another go. The Mac 10 was reconstructed as the Mac 101, built around the beautifully named 14 cylinder Gnome Roan 14K Mistral Major. This was an 800 horsepower radial, and it required the elegant cigar shape of the fuselage to be blunted off to incorporate the engine's tubbier proportions. The main cockpit was now fully enclosed and the rear cockpit was removed, both to save weight and because it was pointless. The original fixed fared landing gear was replaced with a retractable system. All of this meant that speed jumped to 236 miles per hour. Still rather slow, but then the Mach 101 was still rather underpowered. The Rolls-Royce Merlin II was already making over a thousand horsepower by this point. McAneen had already considered turning his idea into a combat aircraft, proposing a Mach 110 in response to a 1934 competition for an Armée de l'Air heavy fighter. This didn't go anywhere, but in 1937, Gordou Lesseur offered the Air Force the G11C1, powered by an 1150 horsepower hispano Suiza Y51. Anticipated performance was an impressive 420 miles per hour, which seems a bit ambitious, but there we are. With the wings closed, its streamlined elliptical wings were only 22 feet in span, opening to 37 feet and a wing area of 185 square feet. Although it wouldn't have been the most manoeuvrable, it would have been impressively fast as an interceptor for the day. Sadly, France's desperate rearmament put the focus on conventional designs and the G11 remained on the drawing board. The Mach 101 continued to fly up to the surrender and thereafter. In 1941, the German Air Ministry decided that the Mach 101 would be more useful at the Recklin Test Centre. It would need to be ferried there. McAneen shrewdly requested one more test flight before being ferried. In true resistance style, the selected pilot deliberately crashed the aircraft, causing sufficient damage to deny the Germans the Mach 101. It was subsequently stored in a hangar at Villa Coulbe, where it was eventually destroyed in a USAF bombing attack. The original drawings of the variable span aircraft had been destroyed at the French Air Ministry to prevent them falling into German hands, but detailed drawings of the damaged plane were made by German technicians and sent to Germany, where considerable interest was shown in them. McAneen continued to experiment after the war. The Mach 123, which first flew in 1947, was unique in being a four-seater with all occupants sitting in tandem. The aircraft displayed no significant vices or untoward characteristics, somewhat proving the concept. The extraction-retraction system worked perfectly, powered by the same quarter-horsepower motor. Indeed, so well did the Mach 101 perform during its flight test that the pilot put the nose down at 13,000 feet, cut the engine, extended the outer wing panels, and succeeded in gliding it for an hour. Unfortunately, McAneen's telescoping wing concept came to an ignominious end during one flight when the engine failed, necessitating a forced landing into a potato patch. He later proposed vertical takeoff aircraft with stowable rotors, which didn't leave the drawing board. Van McAneen died in 1973, his career of what-ifs and maybes behind him. <laughs>